You're listening to A New Beginning with Greg Laurie, a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Visit our website and learn more about Harvest Partners at harvest.org. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie takes us to a miracle described in the book of Acts, causing the jailer guarding Paul and Silas to want to become a believer. What must I do to be saved, he asks. And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Why do we complicate this message? It's so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. That's our message. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. Some people come to Christ instantly as soon as they hear the gospel. It's the miracle of a moment. Others resist that decision for decades until one day they realize their need for Christ. Sometimes it's a crisis or tragedy that brings them to that point. Other times it's as though their eyes suddenly open. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie shows us the miraculous conversion of a certain Philippian jailer, a conversion that would sweep through his entire family. Grab your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 16. And the title of my message is How to Look Up When Things Look Down. Now what we're reading about here in the book of Acts is the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And Paul now has a new wingman and his name is Silas. So now they're headed to a place called Philippi. So he arrives with Silas and there's this lady there and her name is Lydia. Lydia was a very affluent woman. It says that she sold purple garments. So back in this day, uh, treating expensive cloth with expensive purple dye would be what we would call a designer gown, a designer shirt. Uh, So this is a woman who was very affluent, very well off, and this is the first convert of this second missionary journey. So here's the devil now with his counter attack. Acts 16 verse 16. As we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination who brought her master's much profit started following us. So this demon possessed woman now starts following the apostles. She was shouting, these men are servants of the Most High and have come to tell you how to be saved. Uh, Actually this word she said could be translated she shrieked. So here's Paul and Silas walking along through Philippi. She's behind him screaming out they're servants of the Most High God. They're going this woman's really getting on my nerves. And uh, it's interesting because in the original language it says she had the spirit of Python. And, And what that means is there was a myth that the python snake guarded the temple of Apollo. And so there was this a weird demonic thing. And so Paul cast the demon out. Well now the people who were controlling this woman, effectively trafficking her, pimping her out if you will, and making a lot of money off of her were outraged because this witchy woman was their source of income. So when they exercise the demon, they also exercise the income for her master. So now they're angry. Acts 16 verse 20, though, they go and try to whip up the people and the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted. They're teaching the people to do things against Roman customs. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beat them with wooden rods. So we pick up in Acts 16 verse 23 what happened after that. They were severely beaten. Then they were thrown into prison and the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So he took no chances and put them into the inner dungeon and clapped their feet 
in the stocks. Around midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake and the prison was shaken at its foundations and the doors flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped and he drew his sword to kill himself. Paul shouted to him, don't do it. We're all here. Trembling with fear, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved along with your entire household. Then they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. The same hour the jailer washed their wounds, he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized and he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Wow. Isn't that one of the greatest stories in the Bible? So Paul and Silas are flogged. Verse 24 says, He clamped their feet in stocks. They were thrown into a dark, filthy, underground hole. A vermin-filled dungeon. Their shredded backs were laid open from the whipping. They were put on hard ground. They were in these stocks that were spread uh, causing excruciating pain. And they didn't know what their future was. They didn't know they were going to be delivered. Paul and Silas had not read Acts 16 yet. <laughs> they were living it in real time. As I've often said jokingly, Job never read the book of Job. He didn't know how the story ended. They might be free because God delivered Peter, but they might die because God allowed James, excuse me, Stephen to be martyred. Well, James as well, actually. So he didn't know how this story would end, but that's what makes this all the more remarkable when it says in verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and you're troubled by something? You, something's bothering you, some worry, some anxiety? That's a good time to pray. I don't know if you should sing. You might wake up your spouse if you're married. But uh, you could. But remind yourself of Scripture. Correct your thinking with what the Word of God says. And that's a good thing to do. In fact, the, uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 42, verse 8, Through each day the Lord pours His unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing His songs, praying to God who gives me life. They're singing praises to God. And the other prisoners were listening. By the way, this word for listening means to listen very carefully or literally to listen with pleasure. I don't think anyone had ever heard anyone sing in this dungeon before. Now were Paul and Silas doing a two-part harmony? You know, Lennon McCartney, Everly Brothers, something like that? I, I don't think so. But the fact that they were giving glory to God in such adverse circumstances really caused others to pay attention, listening with pleasure. Have you ever been maybe driving along and you have the radio on and you're listening to music and a song you like comes on, so you turn it up? Oh, I want to hear this. I love this song. Then you sing along with it. Then someone turns the volume off and you're singing all by yourself and you don't sound nearly as good as you thought you did? Well, they're singing praises to God. Everyone's listening because this is such an unexpected thing. And it reminds us there that there's a lost world out there. And they're watching you and I as a Christian. And they're watching what we do when things go the wrong way. How do we handle it when a child goes prodigal? How do we handle it when we're laid off at work? How do we handle it when we get sick? How do we handle it when hardship comes into our life? And when we can still give glory to God, that is a powerful testimony that will open their heart, as it did in the life of the jailer. He had never seen anything like this before. He was moved very deeply. Now an earthquake comes, and it's, it's a supernatural earthquake because no earthquake would break 
uh, chains off of your hands necessarily. All the doors fling open. This guy's ready to kill himself. Why? Because if you're a Roman jailer, given this responsibility and your prisoners escape, you will be put to death. So he thought, I'm just going to do it myself. And Paul stops him. Don't hurt yourself. We're all here still. And this man falls down before them. And I love the verbiage, and I use King James here instead of New Living. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> A term of respect. Sirs, gentlemen, uh, whatever you have, I want it. What must I do to be saved? So Paul gives them the truth of the gospel. You see, Paul probably could relate to this guy. He thought, oh yeah, I know this guy. I used to be this guy. Except maybe I was a little worse. The fact that this man could whip them and treat them so horribly. Well, Paul used to hunt down Christians, send them to prison, even kill them. So he thought, I used to be that way. I want to help this guy out. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And immediately the jailer believes and he washes their wounds. Verse 33 says, and everyone in his household was immediately baptized. Now, I love how his whole home was impacted. A lot of times the way that Jesus comes into a family is through one person. One person believes. They become a Christian. And now this kind of upsets the family. Jesus said, do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, division. A mother will be divided against her daughter. A father against his son. Your enemies will be those of your own household. We read that and say, what? I thought Jesus came to bring peace. He did, and he does. But sometimes, before that peace, there's a division. Let me illustrate it because many of you have lived this. So you become a Christian and at Thanksgiving maybe there was a lot of drinking and a lot of partying and a lot of whatever. That was my life before. And, uh, but now you're a Christian and you say, you know, I'd like to pray when the, it's time to eat. Say grace. You've never said grace in your family before. And okay, whatever. Let's pray. And you pray your prayer. And uh, a lot of people don't like it one bit. But then one other family member comes to Christ. Then another one comes to Christ. So there's division at first. Resentment. But now they're coming to Jesus one by one. And before you know it, it's a Christian family. I've seen it happen so many times. Passed on from generation to generation. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. Hey everybody, I want to encourage you to join us for something we call Harvest at Home. It happens every Sunday at harvest.org and on our brand new app, Harvest Plus, which is available on your mobile TV devices. Download it now and you can watch Harvest at Home with Christians from around the world as we worship together and study God's Word. So again, join us for Harvest at Home at harvest.org or on Harvest Plus. Well, we're in Acts 16 today as Pastor Greg presents his message, How to Look Up When Things Look Down. It's one of our top 10 most requested studies of the year. So look at all of the people that Paul and Silas reach in this chapter. The up and the outer, a lady named Lydia. The down and the outer, the demon-possessed woman. The soldier somewhere in the middle. So Lydia, the designer, the former snake girl and a jailer. Python girl. All these people come to faith. The rich and the poor, the slave and the free, the man and the woman, all one in Christ and ready to rock their world. And they became the nucleus of the church of Philippi that Paul wrote an epistle to known as Philippians, right? Now let me come back and consider the question of the jailer. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved, he asks. And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Why do we complicate this message? This is the Apostle Paul, a very credible source that we can look to on how to share the gospel. As I said earlier, people can get so tied up into a theological pretzel as they're trying to articulate the gospel, no one can understand it. I don't even think the person describing it understands it. 
It's so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. That's our message. But we have to define it. What does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is a mere intellectual assent to the facts that a man named Jesus came to this world, died on a cross, and even rose from the dead? It includes that, but there's much more. Because the Bible says the demons believe and tremble. Going back to Python Girl. Um, what was she saying? These men are servants of the Most High God. Was that technically true? Actually it was. It's just the way she said it. And that she was possessed by a demon. Even the demons believe and tremble, you see. So some people will say, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm saved. Well, do you believe in the way the Bible tells you to believe? Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. By implication, believing means to take hold of one thing and let go of another. Or to put it another way, it's to believe in and repent of. See, you have to repent of your sins. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, they said, what shall we do? They wanted to believe. He says, repent and be converted. And times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. To repent means to turn from known sin. Now honestly, you may not know all the stuff you're doing to sin yet, so you repent of what you know to repent of. And as you get to know the Lord better, you repent of more things. Because you realize there's a lot of things that aren't right. But the point is, is believing means to trust in, to cling to, and rely on. It's to put your full weight on something. I'm putting my full weight of 160 pounds. <laughs> Wait, what are you laughing? What are you laughing? <laughs> That's my left leg. Okay, so I'm putting my full weight on this platform. I'm expecting it to hold me. And you put your full weight in Christ, as I pointed out earlier. It's not Christ plus good works. Christ plus baptism. Christ plus X, Y, or Z. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe in Him. That's what it means. <laughs> you say, well, saved. That's kind of a weird word. I don't think it's weird at all. Isn't it the perfect word? I mean, if someone was in a burning building and a courageous firefighter rushed in and brought them out, if you read about it later, it would probably say a person was saved. Uh, if someone was drowning out in the ocean, caught in a riptide, and a lifeguard swam out to save them, that's the word we used. They saved them. And this is what God does. He saves us. You say, saves us from what? He saves us, for starters, from future judgment. Romans 5, 9 says, since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will save us from God's judgment. How will I be saved? The Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's what we need to do. We call on His name. You know, it, sometimes you hear people say, well, I, I tried Christianity. I tried Jesus Christ. It didn't work for me. Well, I immediately dismiss your statement because I know you didn't try Jesus. First of all, he's not a product. Okay, so it's, what's a return policy on this? I'll be honest with you. I like to play around with gadgets, okay? So I'll order something online. But first thing I do, return policy. Can I return this? Is there a restocking fee? Okay, good. Because I want to see this in real life and I want to see if I like it. Look at it, eh, I don't like it. Or hey, I do like it, whatever. So people come to Jesus, all right, what's the return policy? Eh, it's not working, I tried it for a whole week. <laughs> Jesus Christ is not a product. If it didn't work, it's because you failed, not because he failed, because he's not an it, he's a him, and he'll change you. <laughs> I'd be like a person saying, yeah, I tried the whole medicine thing, it didn't work for me. I'm still sick, wait, what happened? Well, you went down to the doctor, he uh, did a diagnosis of your problem, said you need to take this medication twice a day until it, the bottle's done. And I think you'll be better. So you go down, you get your prescription filled, and you never open it, never do anything the doctor said. You get sicker. Yeah, I tried medicine, it didn't work for me. No, you didn't follow the doctor's directions. Or I tried the whole health club thing. 
I did the whole gym membership. You joined a gym? Yes, I did. Did you ever go to the gym? Oh, yeah. What did you do? Stood around and talked. Then went for donuts afterwards. Okay, that, that, no, you, that's you. That's on you. Don't say you tried the gym and it didn't work. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. So if you really believe in Jesus and you start following Jesus and you repent of your sins and you start reading the Bible and you get involved in the church and you develop a prayer life, your life is gonna change. I'm just telling you right now. That's guaranteed. <laughs> Don't worry about the return policy. You won't want to return anything. Yeah, so believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So let me close with that. Maybe there's somebody here and there are people here. It's just weird things preachers say. Maybe there's somebody here. Well, aren't you talking to people? Yes, but I say this. <laughs> somebody here. But there probably is someone here who, who says, I'm here at church. I, I like it here. I, I don't fully understand all of this. I do want to change, but I don't know that I'm saved. I mean, I don't have the guaranteed assurance that I, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, let's clear that up. Because I'm telling you, you can walk out of here today knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt your sin is forgiven and you're going to heaven one day. What does Jesus say? He says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe in him. And how do you do that? What did the jailer do? He, he just believed right there. I believe. And all right. Let's go for it. Let's baptize you guys. This is amazing. How long did that take him to do? It doesn't say in a month past. No. It was immediate. And that's how quickly God will save you and forgive you of your sin. Let me give you an opportunity in closing to get right with God and be saved and know that you'll go to heaven one day and be ready for the Lord's return. Let's make sure you're right with God. Let's pray. Father, I pray for any person here now. If they don't know you, I pray at this very moment your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts and bring those that are not saved to you to be saved, to be forgiven, to be made right with God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pastor Greg Laurie with an important closing prayer. And if you'd like to make a change in your relationship with the Lord, Pastor Greg will help you do that in just a moment before today's edition of A New Beginning concludes. Well, Pastor Greg, we're excited to make available your new book called As It Is in Heaven. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, what are some of the common misconceptions about heaven? Uh, believers know what the Bible says. What do people outside the body of Christ say about the afterlife? What are some of the common uh, fallacies that we hear? Yeah, good question. Well, I think the problem is a lot of us have our impressions of heaven from movies or art or even cartoons, right? I'm going to sit around on a cloud strumming a harp with a bunch of fat baby angels hovering <laughs> over me, or I'm going to be bored beyond comprehension. Okay, that's all ridiculous. Those are caricatures of heaven. First of all, heaven is a real place for real people to do real things. Uh, heaven is not some vague mystical thing. It's a destination. It's a place. It's as real as any city you've been to, as any place you've been to. In fact, the Bible says that heaven is a city. Heaven is a country. Heaven is a paradise. So think about a city uh, that you've been to. Now, so many of our cities are filled with crime and, and urban decay and so many problems, but Think about the best city you've ever been to and maybe the nicest restaurant you've eaten in in that city. And, and now magnify that many, many times you get a glimpse of heaven. Listen, the Bible says when we get to heaven, as an example, we will eat. Hmm. I mean, I think that's literal. We're going to eat. It's called the wedding supper of the Lamb. So you'll be able to sit down with the great patriarchs and matriarchs of Scripture, the men and women of God, and have a meal with them. I mean, you could sit down and say, hey, Martha, could I have another serving of that? Or 
Peter, could you hand me some more bread? Or, hey, Lot, could you give me a little more salt for my meat? <laughs> oh, Lot, you're so sensitive. Chill, man. You know, I'm just kidding. But you have to read the story of Lot in the book of Genesis to get that weird joke. And I'll be reunited with my loved ones who've gone on before me, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother, my father, my son, Christopher, mm. many friends that have preceded me to heaven. But best of all, even more than the great men and women of the Bible, even greater than seeing our loved ones, you'll be with Jesus. And that's what heaven is all about. It's about being with Jesus. So I've written about this and a lot more about the afterlife in my book, As It Is in Heaven. So I address topics like, what is heaven like? Where is heaven? What will we do in heaven? Will heaven be boring? Uh, And many, many more questions that people have about the afterlife. And I'd like to send you this book, As It Is in Heaven, for your gift of any size. I think it will answer a lot of your questions. And I trust it will be a blessing for you so you can become more heavenly-minded and the best use of that phrase and learn more about this wonderful place God has prepared for you. We'll send it to you for your gift of any size to help us continue to bring the gospel to people that need it so desperately. Yeah, that's right. And we have a copy waiting for you right now. Not only would this bring you a lot of encouragement and insight, think of it as a gift for a friend, maybe someone who just lost a loved one or someone facing a serious illness. As it is in heaven, we'll send it to you to thank you for your donation right now. And we won't be mentioning this much longer, so contact us soon. You can call us at 1-800-821-3300. Call anytime, 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org. And then, Pastor Greg, just before we go, would you mind praying with the person listening who wants to make a change today in their relationship with the Lord? I'd be happy to, Dave. You know, as you've been listening to this today, maybe you've heard another voice. By that I mean, yeah, you heard me say a few things, but you heard God's voice speak to you deep in the recesses of your heart, and it suddenly dawned on you, this is what I need, or to state it more accurately, this is who I need. I need Jesus, and I want Jesus, but maybe you don't know how to make that connection. Let me help you. Pray this after me right now if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner, and I am sorry for my sin, and I need your forgiveness right now. Would you come into my heart and my life as Savior, as God, as friend? I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I know that was a relatively short prayer. Maybe you felt something as you prayed it. Maybe you felt nothing. That doesn't really matter because God's word says, these things we write to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. It doesn't say, so you may think you have it or you may hope you have it if God's in a good mood. No, that you can know it. And I want you to know, if you pray that prayer in a minute, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come into your life. So congratulations. You're now a Christian. Now continue to follow the Lord. Yeah, and to help you as you follow the Lord, we'd like to send you Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. It's in an easy-to-understand translation with hundreds of helps specifically for those who are new to the faith. It'll answer many of the questions you might have and get you started off right in your new relationship with the Lord. So get in touch and ask for the New Believer's Bible. We'll send it free of charge. Just call 1-800-821-3300. That's our 24-hour phone number, 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or just go online to harvest.org and click on Know God. Well, next time, as our series of most requested messages continues, we'll see how important it is to run this race of life with our eye on the prize. 
Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher, Greg Laurie. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to A New Beginning. This is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners. So for more content that can help you know God and equip you to make Him known to others or to learn more about how you can become a Harvest Partner, just go to harvest.org.